Conversation with Ron McLean. Welcome to In Conversation. Today on the show, award-winning filmmakers Charles Officer, who was a draft pick of the Calgary Flames. So that's an interesting path in and of itself. And Kwame Mason, creator of the documentary film Soul on Ice, which is the past, the present, the future of black athletes and their contributions to hockey. Kwame is a, a friend. Uh, he has certainly worked extensively with us at Hockey Night in Canada to do a number of the shows. And we've also collaborated on initiatives with the National Hockey League, film screenings, We've done some NHL uh, exhibition game projects, and he has a podcast called Soul on Ice, which he does with Akil Thomas, the hero for Canada at the World Junior Championships this year, and another fine hockey player, Elijah Roberts. So Kwame, uh, he always deals with stories that are important, personal stories, and the power systems. As an example, on his most recent podcast, he interviewed Carl Subban. And I have to say, one of the ways I rely on Kwame is uh, for ideas, and this was a good one. It was his idea to invite Charles Officer to join him on the show today. Charles, as I mentioned, drafted by Calgary. He was a typical Canadian foray into hockey, got him noticed. He was drafted by the Sudbury Wolves, but a chain of events led him to go play in the United Kingdom. While he was playing there, the Calgary Flames took notice. They draft him, and then he plays in Salt Lake City, Utah. But his true destiny wasn't to be in Salt Lake City for hockey. It was to go to the Sundance Film festival and to take shots with his camera. Uh, from the moment he began as a director in 2000, he had uh, When Morning Comes was at the Toronto International Film Festival. He's been style, he's been uh, versatile, uh, just so many examples of uh, exploring the human condition and always with an eye to that scaffolding, the power systems. And I was thinking uh, right now in this moment in history when we are looking for words and at images and wondering who's listening, uh, Alex de Tocqueville, who wrote Democracy in America, had a great line. If one wishes to know the real power of the press, one should pay attention not to what it says, but the way in which it's listened to. It only cries so loud because its audience is becoming deaf. I'll give you that again. If one wishes to know the real power of the press, one should pay attention not to what it says, but to the way in which it is listened to. It only cries so loud because its audience is becoming deaf. We all have a voice, we just have to find different ways how to use them. I don't want you fighting, but the next time someone tries to hurt you, fight back. Everybody has got to fight for something. The trick is, find out what's worth fighting for. You keep learning each time you do it. That's kind of, it's a scary and the most beautiful thing about it. Each story is teaching you or you have to go somewhere to learn something new. It's beautiful. He got death threats. You're playing the white man's game. You know that you can compete with the best, but you're the wrong color. The theme of the film, which is perseverance through adversity. I, the adversity for me was as a first time filmmaker, you know, nobody was gonna give me money for this. Nobody was gonna just let me into their homes. I had sure. to keep persevering. I had to keep telling them that, you know, you know this is something very important. And here are Charles and Kwame. Kwame, thank you for this uh, fantastic idea. And not to put you on the spot here, Charles, but that quote uh, that we were talking off the air, uh, Sanford Meisner, uh, kind of tees up the idea of what we're really hoping to achieve here today. So why don't you tell the viewer about that? Oh, well, well thank you. It's, um, it's something that I, I, I picked up when I was at Peter School in New York um, many, many years ago. And it, 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 it basically says, um, an ounce of behavior is worth a pound of words. And I think that... Um, just watching and seeing what uh, is being done out here in our world right now and uh, the words that are being spoken. And we can actually really be objective as to what is the truth. Well, we'll come back. You're a filmmaker. So obviously you give great thought to unlocking the secrets of, uh, of hearts and how it compares with the, the ideas of power systems in society. Uh, Kwame, yes. uh, tell me how you suggested, Charles, your relationship uh, and, and what you thought would be good about this pairing. Yeah, I've always admired Charles from a distance um, as a person who, you know, always dreamt of doing something in film. You kind of look to see those who um, are doing what you're doing and that you admire. And it's always um, a blessing when that person looks like you. So I always um, admired Charles. And when I was embarking on my first film, which is Soul on Ice, Past, Present and Future, 
um, six degrees of separation, someone knew Charles and, you know, gave me his phone number and he was kind enough to take my call and I gave him my pitch and I talked about it and he was like, that's a great idea. This could be made. This is great. And we left that conversation of like, okay, let's stay in touch. And we didn't stay in touch. And, you know, um, I didn't take it personal. I was just like, well, he's a busy guy. Okay. Well, I just, I just kept going and I kept going. I kept working, finished the film. Film comes out. I end up going to a hockey game. I'm watching the Leafs and I'm walking through the hallways and I see him. I recognize him. I know he doesn't know me, but I recognize him. And I said, hey, Charles officer, I, I, I'm Kwame. We talked. He said, hey, yeah, how's it going? I go, I finished the film and it's out. And he said, yeah, I know. It's, I know, I know. And I said, I, you know, I worked really hard and I really wish we could have, um, you know, collaborated on this. And he said to me that one of the best things I ever heard with the film, which was, you know, Kwame, if I had a stepped in, it wouldn't have been your voice. That film needed to be your voice. And so my brother, Charles, thank you for that lesson. You know, I really appreciate you for that. And I so, really appreciate you. <laughs> when I talked to Ron and Ron was, you know, we were just talking about things. I said, you know, it would be great to have um, myself and Charles come on. We're both hockey guys. We, we both do film and it's just, just a different angle to speak about where we're where we are right now in the world and in hockey and, um, you know, um, and what we do. Well, you know, Charles, uh, one of the great lines you I've heard you say is if you want to have trust with your actor, you put the camera down yeah. uh, and, and we can't right now. Right. We, we are all yes. in a position. Yes. So uh, you, uh, give me a little bit of your heart, your head uh, on, on this whole social discord and uh, th this tragedy. Uh, and then what you think uh, about the role of uh, film and arts in, in expressing it. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I think historically we've seen that even in this medium that that Kwame and I and yourself, we, we work in, um, was built on on individuals and an idea that was even, you know, designed to present, you know, a point of view. And, you know, there's been barriers to be broken to actually providing the space to share stories and what broader ex experiences. You know, we live in a nation where we, you know, um, where we haven't really claimed the history of, and I want to use this term racism in, in, a, in a way because it's, it's, it's being thrown around, but it is a social construct. It is something that was, that was posed upon our thinking, our behavior, and, and, and for a reason. Um, and, and we live in a nation where it's taken so long for us to acknowledge, um, you know, the, the, the genocide that Canadians and settler, white settlers have contributed to mm -hmm. First Nations people. It's taken so long to do that. How can we say that, you know, this social construct doesn't exist within every infrastructure from our schools to the office, in our media, on the streets, um, policing, the evidence has been there. Um, the, statistics, the statistics are there. Um, the cries and the calls for uh, equality has been, you know, um, going on long before Kwame, myself, you, yourself, Ron, have been here. And it's come to this crescendo right now because of such this brutal, violent act that happened in the United States. But we're still here in Canada. We have a premier who basically says, you know, it's not as bad here as is there. Why are we mm -hmm. in this moment, you know, playing a game of comparative suffering when we know that this, this social construct doesn't have borders? We know that hate doesn't have borders. We know that this place of, you know, how to unify uh, a concept and a way of behavior towards one another is something that's, that's been plaguing our, our entire planet. So we're at a point where we need strong leadership and strong voices who are going to speak on the truth. You know, in sport where, you know, we play positions and, and we're asked to be accountable for that position we play. If we break that, if our accountability is lost, then we have other people that are going to fall apart. A system's going to fall apart. And so I think it's right now the question is for indiv individuals is, is to really look at what role they're playing. What position are they playing when we're talking about humanity hmm. at its basic core? So I think there's a, there's a, there's a, it's a time right now for us to, to, to put our egos away, hmm. put our, our defenses away. And it's a vulnerable time, and um, and and we can really, really set an example if we say that we are Canadians and we are this this land of this play. I mean, we have the, the history of the, the the Underground Railroad. We have all this amazing history here that speaks to the concept of freedom. But we can't have a prime minister who takes 21 seconds to speak from his soul. Mm. We can't have that now. 
it's critical. Lives are on the line and we have to pay attention to that. Kwame? Yeah, and, and I mean, if you're gonna take 21 seconds to speak, whatever you say, it's got to be powerful. You know, I think a lot of great speakers take the time to, you know, take in a question and not just blurt out the first thing. And when I saw that, yes. that's what I thought. I thought he was Me too. analyzing. And then when he came out and just kind of brushed it away, I said, man, like, we've got to stop missing opportunities. I find that in our world, the, the universe, our energy, your God gives you certain moments and says, here, I'm going to present something to you. What are you going to do with it? And there's time after time after time where we as human beings don't take these moments and utilize them and, and, and take advantage of that. It's like, you know, when you take the, you know, you look at hockey and you're on a two on one break and you've got to take advantage of that situation and use your partner and, and, and make that right play at the right time. And I think that's what's going on right now. We're not taking advantage of the situation we are in to be able to be honest. And I think at the end of the day, it's all about honesty. And I always mm -hmm. feel the one thing about human beings is you can tell me a lie, I can tell you a lie, but when you look yourself in the mirror, you can't lie to yourself. That's just something innate in us we can't do. And I think again, when you like Charles said, this whole comparative, you know, it's not as bad. And I've heard that so many times. And, you know, I've heard just recently somebody said, well, you know, police brutality and um, police misconduct is not as bad in Canada as it is in the United States. And I had to say to them, oh, well, you know, I remember when I was 19 years old and I had a girlfriend at the time and we were at a, you know, a park just hanging out in the car. And I remember the police knocking on my window and directing their questions directly to her. Are you okay? Are you safe? What is he doing? And I felt like, okay, fine. That's, that's okay. You could, you know, you want to make sure that she's okay, but it just kept going on and on. And she said, no, we're good. We're good. And she's like, are you sure? And I said to the police officer, Hey, she, you know, we're fine. We're okay. And this police officer literally put her hand on her gun. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, okay. And I just remembered the words of my mother who worked for Metro Police for over 30 years. And she said to me, be respectful for the police officer, just come home. And if people think that that doesn't happen here in Canada, I don't know what world you're living in. Well, the reconciliation of uh, the role of a police and how hard that job is and police abuse uh, is, it, boy, it's a big, big question. And, and this, it's part of the whole thing that we're, you know, you, did you see my brother's keeper with uh, Barack Obama the other day, either of you? Uh, they, had, they had a conversation on uh, funding of police. Uh, certainly yes. uh, Philip Cunningham, who was a member of uh, council in Minneapolis, spoke to what he tries to do to divert uh, monies into certain areas that will improve the system. The, the, what we're at is systemic change. You know, with protests mm -hmm. is great, but how are we going to get policy? So I'll, I'll start with you, Charles, if you have a viewpoint on that. Yeah, I think it's, I think the example of, of what's being called upon is, is, is really, really valid and incredible. Um, the term, you know, defund the police is, is, is pretty, is pretty clear. Like there, there isn't, um, you know, anything to unravel about that. And, and it's not to be, not to be, you know, short or, or, or to be cheeky about it. It's true. It's, when we have systems that we've said, I mean, we defund the arts, we defund all kinds of places in, in, within our societies when they, they seem to be not working or not pro providing a certain sort of, uh, pro performing at a certain expectation. And, you know, you know, the police forces across the country, um, you know, will demand more money to put another, you know, or specifically here, um, Police Chief Saunders in Toronto and, and our Premier will be asking to put more police officers on the street to go, what, to harass 15 mm -hmm. and 16-year-olds? That's not money well spent. It's, it's when we have, you know, in the process of um, Regis Korczynski uh, Paquette, like, you know, a call went in and we just break down the process of a call went into the police because someone is having experienced mental distress. Mm -hmm. And the dispatcher has to dispatch somebody why isn't it not already in place when we understand that we've had andrew loku would happen in 2016 well before 2016 but the film around that time when we were right. focusing around that situation the conclusions come to the same issue and years ago by and there isn't an infrastructure shift so who's actually enforcing that who's going to enforce 
Saunders. So who's going to enforce, you know, um, when these five officers that are interviewed by the SIU and there's no one else to speak for the dead? Mm-hmm. How hey. we actually, you know, it's, it's a really, we have to look at how this money is being spent because there are individuals that can go in out and be on the, on, in those situations that are actually, you know, they're, they're cheaper <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and they're more qualified. Kwame, I don't want to lose this with Charles for just a moment. Unarmed yeah. versus. So uh, Trayvon Martin, uh, obviously you mentioned uh, Andrew. Mike uh, Brown was the same time in Ferguson, uh, Missouri. Uh, so what, what did you learn? What, 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 did you, what was your takeaway from that exploration ahead of its time? For me? Yeah. It was, you know, I was so, um, again, like that Trayvon Martin uh, uh, situation just, just floored me. Um, it floored me because again, I, you know, I have some younger brothers and, I'm, and, I'm, and you have to understand that when people are like people in Canada, we have family in the States. Yeah. We have ans- we have family in the UK. We have family around in these places that you're saying that we're not affected by, mm-hmm. but the Trayvon Martin situation really broke me. And I, and, and I, and I was really looking at our communities and wanted to talk about the, find the, the joy in the, and the, and the, the, this quote-unquote diamond in this rough to present that in these communities there are individuals that are bright, creative, intelligent, but they may be the quietest one in the whole community, and they just need space to speak. Mm-hmm. They need space to live. They can't. It, the assumption of of that they're 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 already bad or and up to no good is 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 the same stigma that I grew up with. I'm sure Kwame did, like in these communities. So I want to talk about this city and the systemic, um, you know, imbalance within this idea of, of revitalization, how communities are treated, people of color, specifically black people in these communities are treated when developers and counselors decide, you know, we want to do this here, despite that you live here and we're going to tell you what's best for you all the time without actually engaging in a conversation and, and making it a real, real proper movement, an example of how we can, the reason why you have to revitalize something because you let it, you let it erode. Mm-hmm. And that was an ex- that's a clear ex- example of, of, of the attention to communities where, where people of color live in. You know, the Mike Brown thing was another moment that, that, that floored me. And I had to go to Ferguson. I had to go there. Desmond went there and, you know, connected with some, 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 some comrades there. And, you know, they were bleeding. They didn't expect it to be, to blow up like this, but, but this thing's on a loop Mm -hmm. and we don't, we don't make, we don't draw the, 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 the direct line to, again, um, we can talk about training. We can talk about all these things. I think it's, it's when you're not performing in your job, you should be evaluated if you are capable of continuing to do that job. We are entrusting individuals with firearms and, 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 and a really broad space to assert a level of authority and force that, that, that there is, every line is kind of shifted and blurred. It's almost like they're always moving the goalpost or the line that it's like, well, it's always within force. So who's going to really analyze that? You can't ask the police force to analyze their own problems mm-hmm. that's why people go to therapy <laughs> you know they get a third party um uh, person to actually help them through this problem um it's uh we have to really look at how we're spending our money and especially now the covid you know how we're using this term essential um you know now in this new normal or what we're i don't even want to use the word normal when we get back to a certain rhythm of living again mm-hmm. that's a little safer for everyone like how are these essentials going to be really, really streamlined and, 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 and readjusted to serve? Thank you. Uh, you know, Sorry, Desmond Cole is a journalist uh, Charles is referring to there and Trayvon Martin, of course, was uh, gunned down uh, by a security officer at a community in Florida. Uh, Kwame, I'm sure there's probably something uh, rattling around as you listen to that. Yeah, you know, for me, um, you know, when we're talking about the police force and what they're doing, and I think what we also have to make clear is, and I'm sure Charles will agree, there are some really great police officers out there, and we'll commend them. And, you know, I've got family members who are police officers. 
But at the same time, I think it goes back to, you know, where they're coming from. So a lot of people don't know this, but, you know, when I got out of high school, I went to Seneca College for law enforcement. I was going to be a police officer. And I think it all starts from that area and what they, those kids are learning and evaluating those kids um, who are training and wanting to be police officers. The moment I said that this is not for me was during the Rodney King situation. And I remember we had that discussion in school and the excuses for what the police officers did. Oh, he was high on cocaine and oh, he shouldn't have been. Made me say that excuses these police officers for doing bodily harm to this man and it's on videotape. And we all know what happened with the Rodney King incident. Mm -hmm. But it made me think that the training has to start from the colleges even down to the, to the high schools, these kids that want to be police officers, you know, I know that their intentions are good, but sometimes I feel like, you know, it's a lot of guys that just have this high testosterone that just want to get jacked up. And I remember one of our things that we did when um, you were in school is you had to, you know, in the summer, you took a summer job in security that was put towards your credit. And we all worked at Canada's Wonderland. And I remember in our lunchroom, some of these guys were literally bringing in videotapes of the show Cops and eating lunch, watching Cops. And that made me say, wow, you, <laughs> your energy is in the wrong place, my brother. So I feel like there needs to be some sort of community um, type of training and sensitivity I mean, you know, I, I, I wish they can go back to the days of beat cops where there's a police officer in the neighborhood that everybody knows and it's consistent. And, you know, I, I feel like if you know somebody, you're going to respect them. I know when I was in school, I was very close to a lot of my teachers and I was a really rambunctious kid, but I knew that I didn't want to disappoint them. And we have to be able to have those police officers that say, I'm going to protect this area and that area is going to look and say, that's Officer Brown or that's Officer John. And, you know, he's our friend. So we want to make sure that our neighborhood is, is, is we regulate that so that he doesn't have that problem or we don't have that problem. So, yeah. In some really touching images of uh, officers taking a knee exchanges. Uh, I mean, we are all, you know, common uh, uh, citizens and we all share the responsibility but for whatever reason the uh, you know privilege versus poverty has been one of the benchmarks of, of the strain and there's so many uh, filmmakers uh, Charles is a bit of a difficult question to say but I, I, I off air we were just touching a little bit on your acting experience and of course you work with actors uh, listening uh, becomes mm -hmm. the conduit to performance uh, so mm -hmm. maybe, maybe go on about that yeah um, it is uh, one of the first, you know, things that are really explored when you are, you know, in a, in a decent sort of surrounding of individuals who are, are, are credible and, and trying to teach acting in, a, in a, an incredible way, there's a lot of focus on listening. Um, it is at the, the core of it all. Um, if you're not listening, if you're behaving independently of what's coming at you, you're not behaving truthfully. Mm -hmm. And um, and the listening is 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 you know I'll refer back to Sanford Miser. There's a, a an, an exercise that um, uh, called repeating, and it starts when you're in this theater school and for like half a year you sit in a chair across from your partner, and you repeat a phrase, and it is something that you choose that is about that person that stands out to you. And you can't drop the repetition. You have to repeat it back to each other, repeat it back to each other. And you are forced to listen that if something could be going on, even in that exhaustion of someone repeating the same thing 50,000 times, you are still present mm -hmm. and listening. And it's a way of being present is to listen. And we are living in a, like our time is, is it, you know, people have been crying, making loud kind of, you know, um, statements about being listened to. And, um, and it's time that we do that as a nation. There's Hendrix wants to be listened to. That's uh, Kwame's son. No, no, that's <laughs> not mine. 
Oh, I wasn't I, your Kwame? No, I sent him away. I sent oh, okay. Him. Was that yours, Charles? <laughs> I'm hearing somebody somewhere. Somebody in the neighborhood. It's a neighbor. It's a neighbor. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, I hope he's enjoying the, or she is enjoying the show. Uh, Kwame, you can pick up on, uh, you know, I listened to uh, Renee Hess on that broadcast yesterday, and she said, you can write me uh, for my opinion and uh, my understanding, but don't expect me to answer back right now. I'm tired. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I, again, that when it comes to the, to the listening, um, you know, a friend of mine in Los Angeles, she's an actor, she's an actress, and she reached out to me and how she was torn. And, you know, in this long paragraph, the one thing she said to me is like, what can we do? What should I be doing I, to control my anger? And how do I, you know, redirect this anger? And I said, you know, you're a great actress. Listen. You learned that. That's your fundamental. I went to a school called Sears and Switzer, uh, an acting school here in Toronto. And that's the one thing that always stood out to me when we were training, which it was just being able to be present and to listen to people. And if we were to take those principles and, 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 and you know, apply them to us as human beings, I think we would learn a little bit more because I think people you know, don't use their listening ears. You know, my son Hendrix, when he goes to school, the teachers say, Hendrix, listening ears. And how do we lose that from being a child to being an adult? Why do we assume that we know everything? Because we don't. I don't know everything. Charles doesn't know everything. Ron doesn't know anything. The one thing I love and respect about Ron McLean, and I'm sorry to get to, you know, to put shine on you right now, is the fact that when you don't understand something, you'll call me up and you'll say, Kwame, Here's my question, here's my concern, and then you let me go. And sometimes I'll ramble and I'll say, Ron, I'm sorry for just rambling. And you know the thing Ron says to me he goes, don't worry, Kwan, I'm just listening, I'm just listening. And that's what we need to do. We just need to listen to each other. And even if we do not agree, we have to empathize with where I am coming from. Just because um, you don't agree with me, doesn't mean that I am wrong. And just because I don't agree with you, doesn't mean you're wrong. But it doesn't mean we have to go back and forth and just have this anger amongst each other. I think if we listen and just be friendly with our ears, we will understand more so. And even in that understanding, I still may not agree, but I understand you. And I'm going to respect your decision and I'm going to respect, respect the path that you're going. You know, when we're when you hear uh, people talk about Black Lives Matter and there's always that counter narrative of, no, all lives matter. It's just like, just listen to us. You know, just listen. And you don't even have, if you don't agree with us, then why even participate? Just let it be, let us understand that. Let us be in our space. But, um, you know, the world needs a lot more ears. And, but, you know, at the end of the day, I am optimistic. I really believe in that little redhead girl when she said the sun will come out tomorrow. And so that's, the, that's where I'm living. That's fantastic. And thank you, you know, Kwame. It's beautiful. You, you, he's done so much for my uh, blind spots, Charles. I can't tell you. Unconscious bias. Training, <laughs> at work right now. It's a beautiful, you're right. Out of this tragedy is a lot of clarity and, and, and hopefulness. I'll give you the last word, Charles. You're, you, you can tell me what you're working on, or you can just uh, maybe speak to a, a final sense of, of, of resolution or, or hope on this issue. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll choose to speak on the, on, on the idea of hope. I, I think resolutions come from a, a real collective um, consciousness and 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 that's on us so so ho let's hold ourselves accountable to do that um Kwame's the best uh, wingman you could ever have <laughs> and uh and vice versa Ron um you know we saw you know a pres uh, a president come into um, America at a time where I mean when I was growing up that I was told that I will never see a black president mm -hmm. and we saw it I witnessed the impossible that was mm -hmm. told to me as a child in 2008. Um, his message was of hope. It, it, it galvanized uh, a country in a way that I have still yet to see that we can do, we have done in Canada. Um, I just ask that, you know, it shouldn't take these extreme acts of, of of horrific things to our humanity for us to respond. Um, the hope is that we can recognize that that listening is critical and and it's a time for actual love cannot exist in a place where hates hates being followed. Mm -hmm. And to quote another brother, he said, "Do the right thing." Mm -hmm. And I think we all have we all simply understand what that is, and 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 we have to work towards that. 
Good, Kwame, would you like a word? You know, all I want to say to our brothers and sisters out there is through every negative, we will have to find a positive. Let's be proactive, not reactive. And for all my white brothers and sisters out there, just listen. Be a part of the solution by listening and internalizing and looking within your system and saying, what are we doing wrong? You know, I've seen a lot of companies here in Canada say, you make their statements and, you know, and we're going to be better and we're going to do better. And I'm watching. I'm watching. And the one thing I've talked to you about, Ron, is to understand the plight of minorities, you have to be around minorities. So everybody out there in your companies, mm -hmm. go into your offices or think about your, your environment and look and see your hiring practices. I'm not saying you gotta just give anybody a job. I'm just saying when you're going out and you're looking for somebody, look for somebody, not mm. for someone specific. You feel what I'm saying? I do. I think I would say an ounce of uh, hearing is worth a pound of hiring. That's right. <laughs> That's right, brother. Hey, you know, hey, let's be inclusive. Charles Kwame, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you Ron. so much, Ron. Thank, thank you so much, you, Kwame. Thank you, brother. My gratitude to Charles and Kwame. Back on Wednesday, 70T4 Pacific, we'll close as always with a song lyric, They'd Rather See Me Down, Put My Soul in the Fire. But we keep going higher and higher. Nipsey Hussle, John Legend, DJ Khaled. For all of us, thanks for watching today. So long.